Welcome, Bo Hashem, to our lesson, Likutei Mo'aran. We're about to start the third part of Torah 65. Don't worry if it's your first time, because we do a, a review of the last two parts, and everybody will be up to date. And I always like to do reviewing, because the more we review, the more we retain. And Rabbi Nachman's teachings are to bring us closer to Hashem and to bring us much happier. Tonight's lesson is entitled The Ultimate Good, and this is one of Rebbe Nachman's most encouraging and uplifting teachings, and he explains that all suffering comes from Hashem. Person suffering, like everything else. Hashem, the first principle of Muna, he alone does, does and will do everything. So the good and the seemingly not good, it all comes from Hashem. So like everything else in life. So therefore, when a person experiences difficulties in life, uh, he or she should focus on the ultimate purpose. Don't focus on difficulty. What, what's happening now? And we'll explain that. So by focusing on Hashem, because it, the ultimate purpose, it's Hashem's will and intention that uh, we suffer whatever we're suffering. We have whatever difficulty, whatever challenge we challenge. This is what Hashem wants. And Hashem's intentions are all good. It's to bring us closer to Him. It's to correct our soul, to uplift ourselves, to complete our mission on earth. It's a beautiful puzzle where everything is good, good, and good. But it's like in buildings. Sometimes a, a builder, a carpenter, he can, on the way building, maybe gets a, it smashes his fingernail with a hammer or something like that. Okay, but this doesn't stop, keep, stop building, still building. We're building all the time. And we know people who strive for greatness, they have difficulties. They have great athletes, difficulties, Uh Victorious soldiers, especially in, in special forces units, not an easy life. So, but when we look at the purpose, uh, the suffering becomes much lighter, and a person will feel joy and say, in the middle of suffering. Sees why? Why am I suffering? In other words, if an athlete is having a terribly difficult workout and he wants to make the national gymnastics team at the Olympics, I say, oh, what's the purpose? The purpose is good. It's good. And this is what I have to do to get there. Well, this is the same thing with us. We want to add a correction. So we're going to get close to Hashem. This is the ultimate championship in life. Okay, that's the ultimate good. So we're going to begin, begin tonight's lesson. Let's review the first and second parts. So everybody will be up to base. Okay, Rebbe Nachman is sharing in Torah 65 the inner secrets of a passage we learn from the book of Ruth, where Boaz takes Ruth under his patronage and he invites her to glean in his field. Okay, we'll talk about that at the very end, what, what the particular passage means. So in our first lesson, Rabbi Nachman described the field. Why did the field? And the Book of Ruth talking about a particular field, a particular field where Ruth gleaned, a field belonged to Boaz. So what's the field talking about? Rabbi Nachman says there's a wonderful field. And he described the field with these rare plants and exotic trees and wonderful fruit growing on that field. And these plants, you know what they really are? They're holy souls. Their souls. But outside of the field, there are many naked souls wandering around in limbo, and they want to get back inside the field, but it's very, very difficult. And so they're waiting for rectification, and they're waiting to get back into the, looking forward that they can get back into the, into the garden also. So these souls, how do they get back into the garden? They're dependent on the master gardener. Now, who's the master gardener? The master gardener he knows just what's best for each individual plant, each little tree. What's a metaphor, Rabbi Now, a metaphor there's what's best for each soul. And the master gardener, that's uh, the Moses of the generation. He knows how to correct each soul. But the master gardener, not just be a good gardener, know about souls. He's got to be a warrior and a courageous and wise sadik. What's a warrior? A spiritual warrior. I mean, it doesn't need 22 inch biceps. It doesn't need to be a sharpshooter. It needs to be a spiritual warrior where he's undaunted in the face of the evil, evil inclination. The evil inclination scares many people and uh, discourages many people from trying to get close to Hashem. And many people, especially in modern society, there's the path of least resistance. The minute they get a little bit of resistance, they back off. No, no, no. They don't want to fly. They don't want to fly. Okay, give me a, 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 a bottle of Coca-Cola and a bowl of potato chips and uh, Netflix on the TV set and sit back and, okay, you can't get great big a couch potato. Couch potato doesn't go anywhere. So the, the master gardener, he's got to be a warrior. 
And he's the spiritual leader of the generation. And as the spiritual leader of the generation, his life is not easy. If you join us for a Muna hour and learn Psalms on Wednesday and see the type of life King David had or difficulty. This is now we can smile tonight. Last night, last night's lesson was wow, it was it, the, the difficulties that King David went through. And this all the greats, all the greats in generation had difficulties. The greater they were, the more uh opposition they had because that's the dark side the dark side doesn't want everybody getting their uh, spiritual correction what we call tikkun olam when in enough individual people get their spiritual correction then the world is corrected that's the dark side's job to try and prevent that he puts he's the opposition on the field because if we're not opposition in the field it wouldn't be worth anything there's no context for reward and punishment if there's not a, a complete balance between evil and good so if you take, now imagine the lofty spiritual level of the master gardener, who is the spiritual leader of the, of the, of the generation, he's got so much against him. And this is what's called an even battle. It, it's tremendous. His power is, is, is phenomenal. Okay. So, but he's not intimidated. He's a, he's a, he's a hero. He's not intimidated by hardship. He's not intimidated by challenges. And he doesn't give up. And despite everything, he tends to the fields every day, the field in general, and to each individual plant, each individual plant, each individual soul. So the real Moses of the generation, the King David of the generation, who we learn in, in Psalms, we learn in the moon hour, that he has a soul like a kaleidoscope. It's called the all-inclusive soul because he's Mashiach, or he has this potential of being Mashiach. And if he's not, uh, the generation isn't worthy, he's not going to be revealed, but he's got the potential. And therefore, what he suffers, everybody suffers. So we could all relate to him. We all can relate to this leader. And that's why we all relate to the book of Psalms, because King David suffered everything that every single one of us suffered. So when the master gardener succeeds in rectifying a soul, what happens to that soul? The soul all of a sudden gets the power of holy speech. And it, the soul, it, it's very good very good for the soul inside. The soul feels happy. And now the soul has <clears throat> a yearning to pray. Just as if somebody that's hungry has a yearning for the refrigerator, the soul has a yearning. What's the, I, I need to pray. I need to if, if, pick up a book of Psalms or to go out in the field. I need to talk to Hashem right now. Okay, he needs to pray. This is the yearning that the soul has. And when a soul has that yearning, when you have this type of appetite, your soul is in a good place, a very good place. And one thing we mentioned mentioned last week, you have to know, when people say, wait a second, who's the master gardener of this generation? Then indeed, it doesn't, you don't need to find him because as long as we're learning Rabbi Nachman's teachings, Rabbi Nachman was a master gardener. <clears throat> so by learning Rabbi Nachman's teachings, we get under his wing. And the master gardener, he could do a lot outside, lot more outside the flesh than he could do within the flesh. Okay, so Rabbi Nachman tells Tell each of us to get higher. He helps each of us get higher. Okay, so when we get higher, our prayer is perfected. When our prayer is perfected, we get closer to Hashem. That was our first lesson. In our second lesson, we learn that when the soul does the will of Hashem, it bears fruit, bears wonderful fruit. And what happens when the soul bears fruit? It causes the eyes of the master gardener to shine. <clears throat> what happens when the master gardener's eyes shine? He can gaze far into the distance, both in time and in space. Not only can see from one end of the world to the other end of the world, but he can see in time, can see into the future, and he can see into the past. And that's why the great Sadiqim, they knew what's going to be. And we can see, for example, uh, can read books with great Sadiqim, and they can tell exactly what is going to be right before Mashiach comes and describe to, to a T. Exactly what's going on, the war with the the war with the Ishmaelim and the Erevrav, the Rifraf, when they take over the Jewish people, they take over the government, and it's been anti-Amuna, anti-Torah government. It's exactly like reading the daily newspaper. Okay, so they see they far into this, far into the future. Not only that, they can see far into a person's soul, both the time and space. When they look into the soul, they can see what that person needs to correct in each previous go-around, all the way back to Adam and Eve where they came from, and they give them that soul correction. And the Master Guard helps is sometimes, you know, uh, 
you have an urge to do a particular mitzvah. You have an urge to learn a particular section of Torah. Let's suppose, wait a second. I'm not sure that uh, I'm properly honoring my parents. So all of a sudden you have an urge to learn the laws of honoring the parents. Okay, you feel separate people who read books about that? And what is entailed? <clears throat> There's a book called Sefer Chinuch, the, the book of education. It's written by Rishon, Rabbi Arna Levi. And it tells, it explains every one of the 613 mitzvot of the Torah and the ramifications of each one of those mitzvot. So a person picks that up and he learns and learns in death. And then he reads the latter day books that written with the particulars of uh, honoring one's parents. And he goes, well, where did all this come from? Where those come from? What he got, this just went into his head. Unless he started and uh, he made shuva and he did self-assessment and he wanted to do the, if he arrived at this, many times this is, comes from above, this comes from above, that the master gardener watered his soul and put this deed, leading him toward him or her toward their soul correction. And this is what the master gardener could do. Why? Because that soul is inside the garden and it's praying. And by that soul praying, praying properly, that the master gardener's eyes, they shine. Now, what happens when the soul goes against the commandments of, of Hashem and the soul doesn't fulfill them? Well, in the worst case, the soul finds itself outside the garden, it loses its status outside the garden. But when it anything that happens, any at any rate, the master gardener is, loses his eyesight, his eyes dim, and then he can't see. He, he can't see when the souls, for example, we see in the Torah that when the people, this week's Torah portion, this week's Torah portion, there was a nasty revolution against the Shem where the people fell into debauchery. They fell into debauchery with uh, the Midianite girls and Moses forgot the halacha. He was the Moses, of, he lost his, he, he started, lost his halacha. And Pinchas came and reminded the halacha, Pinchas saved the day. But we could see that when the people as a whole, they go against the Shem, that the master guard can't see. This is why we can understand that even though there's the soul of Mashiach in every generation, when the generation is not worth it, the, the Mashiach he won't be revealed because he can't function anyway. He can't function anyway, unless. The generations that the, the, the Gemara says if the generation is completely good or completely bad, even if the generation is completely bad, then Mashiach can be revealed. But that will be because if Hashem chooses, that's the end of time. But in a situation like that, uh, where the generation is completely bad, Hashem wants to bring Mashiach, then it's push button wars. It's not nice. Not nice. If we want Mashiach to come nicely, then we have to strive and do our very best to get close to Hashem. For Jewish 613 mitzvot, the, the Noahides, the seven commandments, and like we said, Noahides also can, there's about another 33 uh, important commandments they could fulfill, one of which is honoring parents. Okay, we continue on. And that's why well, we explained that the soul of Mashiach is, if the generation is not worthy, it won't be, it won't be revealed. But at any rate, the master gardener brings each soul that connects to him to the soul's ultimate purpose. For example, if someone says someone's agnostic or someone's an atheist and someone says, what are you telling them all this? Uh, Mickey Mouse, Donald Duck garbage, heaven forbid, heaven forbid, about Master Gardeners and Rabbi Nachman and you crazy breast lovers and this and that. Okay, forget it, pal. You're you're down the road. You're outside the garden. Don't, you can't talk like that about the side. They'd expect him to help you. Uh, you don't have to believe it. If you don't believe in it, you have to have... To have this is where do we see this? He said, What are you talking about? Believe it in flesh and blood. This is Judaism. Oh, yes. If you read uh, what we say every morning in the morning prayers, we sing the song of the sea, that the song that Moses and the children of Israel sang on the Red Sea. And there is a passage in there, Bashem of Moshe Abdul. And they believed in Hashem and in Moses, his servant. From here, we learned that we have to have a belief not only in the Hashem, but in the tzaddik of the generation. Why the tzaddik of the generation? Because he's Hashem's emissary. He brings down the word of Hashem. We believe in Moses because Moses brought down the word of Hashem. There's a one time that Hashem personally revealed himself on the first two commandments, but people couldn't listen to it. They're the heart, they're the soul, wouldn't leave. 
Hashem had to send an angel, a guardian angel, to each person to push their soul back into the body because they, they heard Hashem reveal himself. I'm the Lord, your God. Oh, Moses, tell him to stop. Tell Hashem to stop. We can't hear it. Okay, so the Moses is not from Moses' head. This is what he told uh, he, he told Korach. And uh, last week, I did two weeks ago, the, the Torah portion. He said, uh, if you think I'm, I'm dreaming up this mind, then uh, wait to see what the ground's going to do to you. You're going to have a, a weird death. And as the ground opened up and swallowed him live, the Korach and then the, this is very serious, very serious. And people, that's a belief in the uh, tzaddik of the generation, belief in the true tzaddikim, belief in Moses and Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, uh, belief in Rabbi Nachman Abresta, the Baal Shem Tov. This is uh, the Holy Ariza. This is like saying, but no, they don't believe in Kabbalah. They don't believe there's no Torah of the soul. Okay, sorry. What do you believe in? The, the Manchester Red Devils? That's what you believe in. You know, 11 guys in their underpants kicking a ball in the field and another 11 chasing the ball. 22 said, this you believe in? Yeah. These 22 people chasing the ball and people cursing the stands and cursing the other. This is you believe in. But the Tzadik generation, no. Okay. This everyone has their free choice. All right, you're going to force everything. But this is the fruit that the soul bears. All right. The soul bears its soul. Praise the soul is inside the garden. The soul is connected to the master gardener. And of course, he's he's good, good for himself and good for the master gardener. And yes, is what you said. When you pray properly and you give sight to the master gardener, then you're helping the whole world. Because now the master gardener could better help other people, the Sadiq of the generation. Okay, I'm using Rebbe Nachman calls him the, the master of the field, the owner of the field. Uh, we tell to make it to make our, our imagery using every doctor's imagery. We call him the master gardener because he waters the plants, he waters the trees, he waters our souls, he nourishes our souls, helps nourish our souls. Okay, then in our lesson last week, we're still in our, our second week. Okay, everybody get caught up. Rabbi Nachman taught us the sublime beauty of prayer. Not only teaches that uh, prayer, but it's sublime beauty of prayer. Every single word is like a priceless flower, not like a priceless flower, it's an entire world, every single word. Therefore, when a person stands up to pray, and he recites the words of the prayers, uh, he or she is gathering these beautiful buds and fruits and blossoms from the field. It's like someone walking in a field, you've got someone you really, really love, and you're picking up wildflowers and making this gorgeous bouquet and bringing this gorgeous, exquisite bouquet that you can't buy in any floral store. You found this special, exotic, wild field of wildflowers. And now you give it to Hashem. That's what happens to heartfelt prayers with kavona, with intent. Leave it to Hashem. It's like giving, and the angels that try to block the prayers, they smell this. And it's got an aroma of Ganadin, and they can't block it. When it's got that aroma, it's a gift for Hashem. They can't take away a gift for Hashem. When it's like you bring this beautiful, priceless bouquet of flowers. I don't know. It's just something that they, imagine that you'd get a, a bouquet of flowers for a, for a bride, uh, for a wedding. It costs maybe 500 quid at the floral arrangement, or $700. Very, really expensive. This is much, much more, much, much more. Okay. So this is every prayer, heartfelt prayer is a gorgeous gift to Hashem. Presentation, especially when it is for Hashem's sake. It's not just for me, Hashem, give me this and give me that. That's not heartfelt prayer. That's gimme, gimme. The Zohar says, gimme, gimme. Uh, gimme in Aramaic is hav. So Rabbi Shem Baruchai in the Zohar says, a prayer like that sounds like a dog. Hav, 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 hav. And hav, hav, it does give, give in Aramaic. And that does, that, that's barking. But we say, Elokei Avraham, Elokei Yitzchak, Elokei Yaakov, and every single letter the letter is connected to our soul. The letter doesn't want to leave our soul. The letter says, don't leave me. The Aleph and, and the and Shem's name, the Lama, then the Hey, then the Yud, stay with me, stay with me. And that we get to the end of the prayer and all the letters and all the words are connected just like the beginning of prayer. It's one whole, just like Hashem is one whole. It's like taking these isolated flowers, putting them together in a beautiful coral bouquet. If you've seen a flower arranger, that's a Special profession, flower rangers. She's a really master flower ranger. What he or she could do, I mean, it's absolutely gorgeous. And this is your floral arranger when you know how to pray. If you pray in your own words, not talking about the stripes, when you pray from the heart and you pray because you want to be close to Hashem, that's it. 
not because you want a new Maserati or you want a new house or you need something new or raise its salary. No, a prayer. I'll need to get close to Hashem. Hashem, I need more Muna. Why need more Muna? I get close to you. Hashem, I need to know you're better. You're my beloved father in heaven. You're my whole life. Okay. I want to know you better. I want to be closer to you. Why should I be far away from you? Make a beautiful bouquet, giving to Hashem. So every utterance of prayer, Rabbi Nachman teaches us, every letter, every syllable, every word, it not only comes from the soul, it is a part of the soul. When you pray properly and with intent, you're giving a piece of your soul to Hashem. And that's what we say in the Kriyashma, that you love Hashem with all your might and with all your soul. And what do we do? We give Hashem back. The soul comes from Him. That's a tiny part of Hashem within us. We're actually giving back Hashem the spark, but now we're doing what Hashem does because Hashem gives. And now we usually receive. We receive everything. We receive every heartbeat. We receive every breath. We're receiving all day long. But prayer makes us like Hashem when it's prayer for it to get closer to Hashem. This is prayer. It's like a sacrifice. And what the Torah says, Reach Nichoach Lashem, and like the aroma, the spiritual aroma of a sacrificial offering. And this is why Rabbi Nachman uses the metaphor of flowers. You have to scrape through it deeper. What does Rabbi Nachman mean? What does Rabbi Nachman mean? He's talking about the aroma, the flowers, the aroma of the prayer. The aroma ascends, just as the prayer ascends, just like aroma ascends, and no one can block the aromatic prayers. And that's this comes right to a shim. Okay, so now we know the value of prayer. We continue on to part three. Rabbi Nachman starts part three with one of his classic words, vidda, and you should know. And I've taught this several times, da is two letters. It's a dalad and an ayin that written da, that means you should know. And if it's written opposite, ayin dalad, it's eternity, eternity, something eternal. That's this eternal knowledge, what Rabbi Nachman is telling us. And this is also a basis of our faith, because in the mezuzah, it says Shema. Ayin is the last third letter of Shema. Yisrael Hashem Elokeinu Hashem Echad. Dalid is the last letter of Echad. Hero of Israel, Lord God, Lord is one. And in the mezuzah, we take that Ayin and write it four times bigger than the other letters. And take that Dalid and write it four times bigger than the other letters. And it can be either Da or Ad, whichever way we look at it. And this is one of Rabbi Nachman's secrets. And when he really wants to drive home a spiritual truth, he says, da. So he says, yeah, you should know. This thing of oneness. They we're talking about the oneness of the prayer from the first letter of the prayer to the last letter of prayer. So this is the ultimate. This is our ultimate goal in life. What's our ultimate goal? Uh, in chapter 14 of Zechariah, he says the day will become the day will come when Hashem is one and His name is one. Well, the Gemara asks a question. Well, what are you talking about? It's Hashem's name is, is not one now? Oh, yes, it is. But Rabbi Nachman answers. and says, that atachlit, that's the objective, kulotov, that is an aspect that everything will be good. What does it mean will be good? It will be good as it appears to us. Everything is intrinsically good now. But we see things, there's wars, there's sicknesses, things we don't understand. We don't understand how they're good. Okay, but he said, then when Hashem's name will be one, that means that everything will be one. Everyone will know after Mashiach comes that everything is good. That's one of the things that Mashiach is going to tell us, that it's, everything is good. So therefore, when we learn Torah 65 now, and we already learn that everything is good, then it's as if our personal Mashiach has come. Because every suffering can look at it that it's for our own ultimate good, and we can see the good, like the, the what they say in English, the, the poet said, the, the cloud with the silver lining. We can see that silver lining in the cloud, even though it's a dark cloud, but it's, it's got a silver lining. You can see that, and it's, everything is intrinsically good. And that day, Echad, Rabbi Nachman says, Echad Kulotov, that the oneness is completely good. And the Gemara tractate Psachim, when they commented, when they commented on the, the, uh, the passage that on that day Hashem will be one, that has higher. Okay, uh, so they asked the question, Atu Idna Lavu and Aramaic, with the, today it, it's not one, but they say, here's, the, here's what the Gemara explains. Today, right now, before Mashiach comes, we have two blessings. 
we have a blessing for good tidings. Uh, somebody just tell you, hey, you won the Irish lottery. You just won 24 million quid. Okay, so now you make a blessing. Blessed are you, Hashem, that does good. It does even more good. But then they tell somebody that, heaven forbid, a uh, beloved member of the family has left the physical world. Okay, even though interestingly that, that's good. He's going to a great place. But now we go into mourning, we cry, we love that person, and we hear a tiding, a difficult tiding like that, we say, Baruch Atah Hashem, Dayan Emet. Blessed are you, Hashem, the judge of truth. The judge of truth. So we see today there's a differentiation, says Rabbi Nachman, between the good and the seemingly opposite. But after Mashiach comes, there won't be the Diana Met theory because everything will be good. Everybody knows everything will be good. In other words, after Mashiach comes, uh, somebody says, oh, come on, I'm having a big party tonight with a band and and uh, I'm having a, a, a three-course meal with the money I have left. What do you mean with money I have left? Guy's a millionaire. And he says, I, I just lost $20 million on the stock market. He said, what are you so happy about? It's great. Okay, I don't have the money, so now I'm going to go learn Torah, but I've got a few dollars left. I'm inviting all my friends, and I'm having a, a klezmer, having a big band, and having a big feast, and we're going to dance all night. Okay, tomorrow, instead of going to Wall Street, I'm going to the coil. I'm going to sit and learn Torah. It's great. Okay, so Shem didn't, didn't want to worry about his money. Shem fed me before. Hashem's fed me for the last 55 years. He's going to feed me tomorrow. <laughs> okay, he's great. This is, what, this is the attitude after Mashiach comes, that everything will be wonderful. Everything will be wonderful. People know everything is, everything is great. Okay, so this is in the future that we see it all be one. It's all nothing but good. Okay, but we can attain that now. Rabbi Nachman will say now. Rabbi Nachman says something. This is once again one of Rabbi Nachman's most important teachings. And it's positivity, because when you get the fact of Hashem's oneness, that everything Hashem does is good. And we'll soon see that Rabbi Nachman says there's no bad in the world. There's no such thing as bad in the world. And when you could look at everything for the good, in other words, look at everything, like the champion athlete that's having a really tough workout. And the champion athlete, give you an example. The guy is training. He wants to be the heavyweight boxer of his nation's Olympic team. So he's in the ring and he's sparring with the coach and the coach sees he drops his right guard and plasters him across the left side of the face. And it's a boom. Okay. But it was a controlled hit. The coach saw what he did. The coach says, and the guy hugs the coach. He just got smashed across the face from the coach, but he's hugging the coach. He says, thanks coach. Yeah, because inside the ring, the Russian is not going to give him a controlled punch. The Russian is going to knock him out. So he doesn't want to do that. He's got to get used to it. Okay, we know you got to keep that right hand up. Keep that right hand up. Keep it on. Okay, so he knows it's all for the best. Uh, a soldier also. Soldiers in training, they have an expression in the IDF, uh, that it's difficult to maneuver and it's easy in battle. It's, it's never easy in battle, but uh, the more you practice, the more the, the, the easier it is. But we know it's all, it's all for the good. We've got to prepare ourselves. So nobody, eh, guys, they, eh, they, they, they they complain. Inside, they don't complain. They don't complain. They didn't come here to eat chocolate ice cream. They come here to protect themselves, protect their country, to to learn to be fighters. Uh, so the difficulties. Talk about champion athletes, champion soldiers, victory soldiers, and anybody else that has any difficult talk about uh, a musician, a musician, a concert pianist. How they, how they became great. They, they sit at the keyboard until their, their, their fingers fell off. And then teacher said, do it again, and then do it again, and do it again. That's perfect. And it did perfect. No, it's not good enough. Do it again, do it again, do it again. And they, so the concert musicians, what they went through, they just they said, their, their difficulties are in their level. Anyone who is great in any endeavor has difficulties because a person doesn't become great on comfort zone. Comfort zone, you don't become great. That's it. So Rabbi Nachman says, Ki afilu, kol atzarot, v'yisurim v'araot ovrim al adam, chas v'sholom, em yistakel al atachlit, bevaday enam raot klal, rak tovot gedolot. Thus all the troubles, suffering and evil that befall a person, heaven forbid, 
if he or she focuses on the ultimate purpose to bring them closer to Hashem, to attain their, Hashem wants us to attain our, our potential maximum. When they look at the ultimate purpose, they're going to see that everything is actually good. Hey, suffering strengthens character. Suffering makes me stronger. That's it. And they can see it. Rabbi Nachman says, Ki kol baim He says, for certain. This Rabbi Nachman says, for certain. Not maybe, not maybe. He says, Bivadai, for certain, all the tribulations come from Hashem for his person's good. And bring a point, a very strong point that we bring in three words of Amunah, uh, uh, th three words of Amunah that also is a, based on Torah 65. Three words of Amunah says, uh, what's happening to you? Let's let's analyze let's analyze our our tribulations. Okay, who are the tribulations? Where do they come from? Oh, from our first principle of Muna, they come from Hashem. Who is that Hashem that's given us that tribulations? Oh, that's my Father in heaven. <laughs> what does the Torah say about the Father in heaven? Okay, that He loves you so much, and we say it every day before we say Krishna. We remind ourselves, oh, have a Israel that Hashem loves every one of us. Okay, so if my tribulations come to Hashem, and if Hashem is my beloved Father in heaven, then it's a no-brainer. Therefore, number three, that is all for the best. And we take what Rabbi Nachman says here in a statement. Rabbi Nachman knew it absolutely, axiomatically. And you can see that, like King Solomon said, all the rivers go to the sea. No matter how we look at this statement, when you look at it, it's absolute truth. So now we have to take a journey, which is the biggest distance in the world. The biggest distance in the world is to travel the distance between our brain and our hearts, not between uh, Joburg in South Africa and Honolulu in the Pacific Ocean. That's not the biggest distance in the world. The biggest distance in the world is to take what we know in our brain and to internalize it in the heart. That what Rabbi Nachman says, that for certain, all of our tribulations come for Hashem for our very best either to remind a person that the person needs to do self-assessment and make shuva and make penitence, or to clean him up of his sins. And therefore, the tribulations are a tremendous favor because a person gets cleaned up in this world and he gets to stay in the garden or come back in the garden and doesn't get kicked out in the next world. That is bad news. That is bad news. And this is the garden. We said one thing we learned in the first lesson, that the garden is this world and the next world. And the world, we're, we're serving Hashem. There's a few people in the garden. Most people outside the garden. They're looking for bodily amenities. They're this world, they have no spirituality in their lives, no true spirituality. Maybe they got living room spirituality, you know, that the sign, you know, that they throw the, the, I don't want to say the, the words they throw around, but the, you know, the ersatz spirituality. This is the real deal. This is the real deal. Getting close to Hashem. Because that's the soul. Rabbi Nachman repeats this for the second time. He says, Hashem's intention is certainly only for the good. Don't doubt Hashem. Because one of the biggest embarrassing moments in the next world is when a soul thinks, Oh, Hashem gave me a rough time. Hashem did this to me. Hashem, why'd you do this to me? Why'd you do that to me? Hashem, why did you help me this? And they get to the next world and they see how Hashem did everything out of absolute love, out of absolute intent for the ultimate good for that particular person. We continue on. Nimsa. Rabbi Nava is coming to a conclusion. In all the difficulties and all the tribulations a person has, chas v'shalom, heaven forbid, we don't want people to have difficulties. They went like the the Kozitz or Magid said, we don't want difficulties and we don't want disparagement and we don't want humiliation. But if they come to us, we're going to cherish them. It's a gift. In other words, we're not looking. Nobody wants to be sick. Heaven forbid. And if someone's sick, we pray. We, we pray for the other person. And then, then by the way, this is for us. I would say to the other person, oh, this is good. This is your soul correction. No. If someone else has a difficulty, we love our neighbors, we love ourselves, we have to get to pray for him. Pray for him, very difficult. But if it's happened to me, let me be a hero for myself, not a hero, a hero on somebody else's uh, account. No, this is, they have to be important. Some people don't understand that, that they're crybabies on their own account, 
but the, the heroes are on, on someone else's account. Oh, listen, you should accept it with a Muna. No, my pal, you accept it with a Muna. You pray for the other person that has difficulty. But if that person is already having difficulty, they should. Rabbi Nachman says, Adaba, indeed. That you should be happy because Hashem is giving you a great gift. It's a very good thing. Be happy. She's the Kelbatahlite Swim Halalu. But you can only do that if you look at the ultimate purpose. What is the purpose of those tribulations? Because the ultimate purpose is great. It's to get you in the garden and to get close to Hashem, to the center of the garden. You know what's in the center of the garden? The tree of life. Tree of life, that's Hashem. It's all a metaphor for Hashem. <laughs> that's to get close, 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 to get close to Hashem. Okay. So whenever we see suffering in, in our own lives, it's all for our best. Rabbi Nachman continues, Ubemet, and this one of Rabbi Nachman's classic expressions, Ein shum rab olam. Most of the world doesn't understand this. Ubemet, he says, in truth, there is no bad in the world. Nothing's intrinsically bad. No bad in the world. Wait a second. Uh, Rabbeinu Nachman, haven't you seen Hamas? Haven't you seen Hezbollah? Haven't you seen the Nazis? Have you? Ooh, what would Rabbi Nachman answer to that? He would ask me to another Torah. He said, hold it. You know what created the Hamas and the Hezbollah and all the dark side angels? And they had to open up the Mishnah in Ethics of the Fathers, chapter 4, Mishnah number 13. Rabbi Lezer ben Yaakov says, Rabbi Lezer ben Yaakov, I hope I'm going up north on Sunday. I hope to be at his gravesite. He says that if a person does a mitzvah, he creates a positive angel. Every time you do something good, you create a guardian angel, a positive angel, and your army protecting you. And if a person does the opposite, he creates an accusing angel, a dark side angel. So Hamas and Hezbollah, they are all physical manifestations that have filtered down the world of our transgressions. And for that reason, the Baal Shem Tov says that an enemy cannot touch a hair on our heads unless we do damage to one another. From our own internal bickering, this also, the fact that we are weak in loving our neighbors ourselves, this creates dark side angel, and this manifests itself in Oh, it, wherever you are, you, you can see it in the UK, you see it in America, and certainly see it over here in Israel. Okay, so this is, but that, that's, it's not bad, not intrinsically bad. It's something because Hashem is showing that this is the result of a person's, of a person's negative actions. It creates a negative spiritual force. So Hashem did, you created it. This is Hashem's law of the world. Hashem, when he created the world, he made this intrinsic in, in, in the world, in the blueprint of the world, that if a person does good, he creates a good force, a good spiritual force. What do they say in Star Wars? The force. Okay. He creates the good force. Okay. From, from the force, the light side. And if he does the opposite or she does the opposite, the negative force. But Rabbi Dao, once again, he says, it comes right back in. It's easy to explain if a person wants to understand it. Ein shum rab olam. There is no bad in the world. There is transgressions. And there's, a, in other words, there's spilled milk. You spill milk. What do you say? No, the floor, can stay, the floor cannot stay clean if you spill milk on the floor. So bring a mop and mop it up. And if you spill Coca-Cola, you better mop it up quickly because people are going to either slip. It's going to be sticky. There's going to be flies. It, the floor cannot stay clean if you spill Coca-Cola. Not only that, with what's inside Coca-Cola, it'll probably it can eat away at your floor. It's acid. Okay, it's going to discolor your floor, you know, and clean it up really quick. In other words, when somebody spills something, it's a result. It's a result of a action, action, whether it's intentional or unintentional. Even if someone unintentionally spills the milk, you still have to clean it up. So even if someone unintentionally insults another person, he still has to ask forgiveness. Okay, says, well, I didn't mean it. Okay, but still the damage is done. If the person turns around and swings his head widely, it happens to hit somebody in the face. Oh, I didn't mean it. That doesn't help. The guy's face hurts. You got to apologize to him. 
the sieve, and so that's we have the difference between a shogeg, which is an accidental sin, and a mezid, which is an intentional sin, but the damage has to be done. Both necessitate tshuva. And because both necessitate, they, 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 tshuva destroys the dark side forces. So every time somebody does tshuva, uh, some Hamas guy stops breathing. Because that's it. Because his entire vitality was a particular person's transgression. And that's it. The spirit, but there's no in trend, there's no bad in the world. Rakulotov, Rabbi Nachman says it's only good. And many people at this time they'll take their liquid moron, they close, and they say, I can't believe this, I can't do it. Sorry. Sorry, this is a gateway to happiness. Gateway to happiness. And this is a belief and you live on that. This is the only thing that can put a smile on a person's face in times of difficulty. Because these are all these are difficult times before Mashiach. And Rabbi Nachman said in Yiddish, he said, My fire will burn until the coming of Mashiach. His, what's Rabbi Nachman's fire? Rabbi Nachman's fire is the Torah of Amuna. This is the Torah of Amuna. Rabbi Nachman is e e really explaining the first principle of Amuna that everything is from Hashem and everything is for the best. And it's all Hashem that's from the loving Father. Rabbi Nachman does it with the parables and through the book of Ruth. But really, get down into it. This is nothing. There's no bad in the world. Rabbi Nachman says the reason that a person suffers from tribulations is because they take away that person's spiritual awareness. What's a spiritual awareness? Spiritual awareness means when, when the person sees the sickness, the person sees the monetary loss, the person sees the difficulty, and he doesn't know the tachlis, doesn't know the ultimate purpose. And now he's thinking, he's thinking materialistically. He's not thinking spiritually. Why? Because Hashem wanted him to suffer. Why did Hashem want him to suffer? So that he has to look for more amuna. Hashem, now he has to look for more amuna. Hashem, I need some amuna. Hashem, you got to help me with this. I need some more amuna. I need to understand how it's all the good. This happens. I, I don't think there's a day that transpires in my life. What I have to say, Hashem, I need more amuna. Shem, I can't give this. It's not enough. I need more and more. Well, I'm going to move it from you. Okay, so if uh, we had it every easy street and everything is good and we have all the health we want and uh, we don't walk around with uh, all kinds of problems and uh, <laughs> health and, and otherwise and, you know, nobody's throwing missiles at us and don't have to could argue with the cardiologist about whether to do this operation or not to do this operation or whether to hear it. Uh, uh, Pimpit Fat City, don't think Shem would be close to be so far away from Shem. But to look at our own difficulties in life, everyone, you look at it through spiritual eyes. Look at your difficulties. Let's do some a little bit of homework. Between now and next week, in your heat bodhidut, look at your difficulties. Hashem, help me understand my difficulties. Rather say, Hashem, get rid of my difficulties. Hold it. It's like saying a U.S. SEAL saying, Hashem, get rid of my basic training. Get rid of my advanced training. Hashem, this is too hard. Hashem, get rid of Hell Week. And you can't be graduate. You're not going to be a U.S. SEAL if you don't graduate in Hell Week. There's not a single one of them that's having an easy time. But there's not a single one of them that once they pass it, they say, oh, listen, would, would you go through it? No, no, you're sure I would go through it again. Yes. Yes, it was it was it was hell, but I'll go through it again. Sure will. But this is because we don't understand the good. But see, the U.S. SEAL, they don't take away his spiritual awareness. His military awareness is I want to be a commando. I want to be a U.S. SEAL. I'm there for that pay the price. And nobody hides the big secret of we've got a price that before they go in there, they know what they're gonna have to do, they know the training, they don't feel the difficulty of the training until they get there. But uh, once they get on the line, whew, once they get behind the line, they are sure happy that they had that. Okay, so, so a person is going to suffer until he begins to look at the ultimate purpose. Still, when, by looking at the ultimate purpose means you look at Hashem and you ask Hashem, Hashem, give me my spiritual awareness. And so we can see, if you want to read about spiritual awareness, I have a whole chapter, three chapters about spiritual awareness and the trail of tranquility. Okay, old Isaac teaches a lot about spiritual awareness. Okay, as soon as he remembers that everything is good, then all of a sudden, it doesn't feel the pain of the tribulations anymore. 
כי כשיש לו דעת, מסתכל על התכלית, אין הוא מרגיש כלל סל. When a person has spiritual awareness and understands why he or she is suffering, then the suffering is no longer suffering. It doesn't hurt anymore. I guess a, uh, a soldier in training, a special ops soldier in training, an athlete, does it hurt? It strains. Doesn't hurt. No, they're crying. They're not crying. No, no. They're, they're sweating and maybe grimacing and sometimes you know, I yell to, to relieve the pressure, but it doesn't hurt. Because they feel they know what they're doing. Got to do this. Got to do this. Got to get it done. And they want to get it done. Rabbi Nachman continues. Now he's, Rabbi Nachman is imploring us to understand a hidden fact. is imploring us to understand a hidden fact. Something that is hidden within the human soul. Rabbi Nachman is telling us about ourselves. Listen to about yourself. When a person has very difficult Tri- tri- uh, uh, tribulations, heaven forbid. When a person gets cut, his life flesh gets injured. Again, heaven forbid. When a person undergoes a severe pain, he shuts his eyes real tight. Severe pain. He shuts his eyes real tight. Why? Rabbi Nachman says, we see it tangibly. Rabbi Nachman says when a person wants to look far into the future, far away, or far geographically far, he squints. He squints to look far. He squints. He closes his eyes. He squints like that. Okay. And because what's he trying to do? He's trying to focus. Rather than seeing this whole field of vision, he's trying to focus on this far far away object he's trying to see you can see if you ever watch a plane take off and it disappears disappears as it disappears you look at it you, you squint to try and and focus it on that far distance get the far distance he squints in order to strain to see something that is far away from him this is because the vision is the emissary of the brain and the vision is designed to bring that image into the brain and so when the vision has to focus on something far away it's in the brain rabbi nachman says and he says the most important part of seeing is knowledge to know what you're seeing to know what you're saying that's like an optical illusion Sometimes people could see a sidewalk in the sun and it looks like the waters of a river. But if a person thinks it's the waters of the river, does think it's a, a, a concrete sidewalk in the sun, then you, you could see the vision depends on his knowledge. If he knows that's a sidewalk, he's not going to believe that he's seeing the, the waves in a river or in the ocean, the ripples in a river or in the ocean. Okay, because knowledge is in the brain. So see, the eye connects the brain to knowledge, but... To understand what we're saying right, let's make sure it's not an optical illusion. You have to understand, Rabbi Nachman says in a different Torah, he says, don't let this world fool you. Most people, they look at the world through physical eyes and it's all an optical illusion because they don't see the tachlit. They don't see the ultimate purpose. They don't see what Hashem is doing. They're like blind people walking around. And you have to understand to see the object you're looking at. That the vision gathers the object and puts it in the brain. And when they preach an image, a fast, fleeting image in front of a person, sometimes you see something, a fast moving car, or you're in a safari in, uh, in South Africa and you see an animal running really fast past you and really fast. You know, what did I see? I see a gazelle. I saw a deer, I saw an elk. What, what I see? You can't see it because it ran too fast. The, the eye did not succeed. The, the brain did not have enough information in the eye to register what he saw. The brain needed more time. But even so, he saw it with his own eyes. He saw this image running, saw it with an animal. He just doesn't know what it is. But because the eye didn't have enough time to look at it, the eye couldn't gather enough information inter- to internalize it in the brain. Okay. 
when a, something is very far from us, we don't have the power, especially with Anamuna, we don't have the power to see far and to bring it into the brain. Ah, this is the thing. This one mistake. Why can't we see? Why don't we have spiritual eyesight? Rabbi Nachman says there's so much visual static and so many things in the physical world to fool a person. The person thinks that the world is money and the world is football and the world is fast cars. Crazy. Far from the soul. And the person is unhappy. Why is the person unhappy? The person is so miserable because he's so far from Hashem. Where's emotions come from? They come from the soul. Rabbi Nachman was the greatest psychotherapist that ever lived since King David and the, the, since Moses. And understand, we're talking about the Torah. We're talking about the, the Torah of the soul. And this is what the immunotherapy is based on. Now we have Bo Hashem, uh, the some certified immunotherapists that treat according to Amuna. We have one with us tonight, Dr. Kim, Dr. Kim Krynik in, in New York. She's a PhD in psychology, puts all aside and uses Amuna to, to, to treat people. It's, it's a beautiful thing because this is the real, it's, it's not Freud and Jung and Skinner. It's Rabbeinu Rabbi Nachman and Moses and King David. So you see, when we have the static, all the physical static, then the body thinks that the body is the ultimate purpose. Sorry, body. How long are you here for? 80, 90, 100, 110 years? Uh, uh, the soul has been here a long time. And if it does right, it's going to be here a long time because the tiny part of Shem is eternal. So why are you going, like we explained in Path to Your Peak, and investing so much in the body, which all that hard work is going to go down into the grave and it's going to be fertilizer for those flowers that the... Oof, it's a shame. Not investing, you don't know much about investment because you're not investing in a good investment. You want to invest in long-term investment, not in a short-term investment. Okay, so that's why Rabbi Nachman explains, I days any clush. And if a person has all this physical static, then it's not going to have much amuna. He's not going to be able to get close to Hashem because it's mixing up his brain. The eye is bringing physical information to a brain. Ah, look what beautiful woman that is. Excuse me, I, you got no business bringing that to the brain because that woman is married. And the Ten Commandments says, shall I commit adultery? Get out, get out of here. That is, it's, it's, it's the brain. It's now the eye, because the eye is transgressing. The eye is going to create a, a, another Hamas terrorist. This is what happens. Rabbi Nachman continues. al came. Sikhli stomate novel. It's some same out. Rabbi Nachman says, therefore, when we're looking at the physical world, we have to close our eyes. Close our eyes and not let things confuse us. Only to focus on what we need to do. Okay, we need to cross the street? Yes, we focus on the green light and we focus on the fact that there's no cars coming and we cross the street. But we're not looking at uh, who's crossing the street and, uh, and, and this girl and this guy and what they're wearing and what they're here. No, we're not focused on that. We just want to get safely across the street. This is our tactless. This is our purpose. We can say, need to get to work. We need to do what we're doing. We need to do what we're doing. But we don't focus on anything else. And so many people, they don't get the job done. And this is the, you don't get your soul correction. Look at social media. People, how much it go? You, they, they begin surfing on Facebook and on TikTok and on this. They go from this site to that site to that site to this site. And all these little clips and entertain them. Hey, what did you originally worry? Oh, you wanted to look at... Uh, and find out how much a certain thing costs in a store, something you want to buy. But meanwhile, you waste an hour and a half and you didn't you didn't find out that piece of information you wanted because the TikTok or the Facebook, it stole your brain. And so let it get all this case. So what's it? it's consequential because you didn't close your sight. You got to close your sight and focus on tunnel vision like a champion athlete. I'll explain to you that there's an article on laser beams tonight about uh osteoporosis, keeping your bones healthy. It gives an example of Kim Jong, the Korean karate expert. Okay, Kim Jong focuses on those five cinder blocks. And he's got to have perfect focus. And Kim Jong does exactly what Rabbi Nachman tells us. He concentrates, he closes his eyesight, he doesn't see anything to the right or left. And Kim Jong raises his knife strike, he's going to make a knife strike on those blocks. It's got to be perfectly directed and perfectly right place. Otherwise, Kim Jong is going to break his hand. 
Okay, but he's been did a lot of work and he's got dense bones and he's going to hit that rug. Now, if as he's raising his hand, you say, hey, Kim Jong, if he continues with that, his hand's broken. He cannot have be distracted at all. And you're trained enough, if he has any distraction, he's going to stop the strike. When he does that strike, boom, it's got to go right through because he sees himself, he sees himself before he does, he sees himself, he's going through that those bricks, the cinder blocks, the boards, they're broken even before I started. This is something that Israeli commanders learn. And the thing, before I go to mission, the mission is already over and it's successful. And I have a tiny technical problem how I'm going to complete the mission. That's all. But in his mind, his mind is focused. They teach us to focus. You focus on what you have to do, and there's no option not to come back a winner. No option. Because if there's no comeback a winner, then you don't come back. Uh, this is it. You know, this is the big stakes on the gun. So you can't afford not to focus. You have to focus what we're doing. And this is the same thing in Torah. We have to focus what we're doing. And in prayer, focus on what we're doing. And not letting it show, don't look at who's here and who's there and who's there, who walked into the synagogue. And focus on the prayer. Baruch Atah Hashem. Blessed are you, Hashem. That's the focus. And that's Kim Jong's, right? That's just going to drive those prayers right up, especially when it's going to go up with this beautiful bouquet. So Rabbi Nachman says we have to close our eyes and not look at the world and focus, squint, focus, that start focus on what we need to, what we need to focus on. Okay. We need to focus on the ultimate purpose in earth, which are our goal, our spiritual correction, that is all good and it is all one. All good and all one. That the whole objective of the soul and Baruch Hashem, Baruch Hashem, everybody in the group is actively doing that. We're fortunate to get close to Shem, get close to Muna, and this is the ultimate. This is the ultimate. Uh, less tonight, we internalize. It's going to make each one of us bring a lot of happiness into our lives. Now, see, a person's ultimate purpose, it's far away from a person. We cannot see our purpose in life unless we close our eyes from this world. The Sagno Chazkat, that look very, 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 very close them, close them. I'm not going to look at all these amenities. I don't even want to know about it. Okay. Sometimes Rabbi Nachman says, if close it can't hard enough, then you close them with your hands. Close them with your hands. And just look in your mind's eye at your ultimate purpose. Go for it. Go focus, focus, focus. And this is something that the young generation with all the TikTok and the smartphones and this and that. My, my generation, I, Eric, we know how many times we walk out of the house without a without a, a, a telephone, it, but the telephone is not my, my part of my my baggage. And people, it's the young people, they, we say young people, there's a, a terrible uh, tragedy in Israel where babies are left in the hot cars. In Israel in the summer, you leave a baby in a hot car. Inside that hot car, it's very quickly going to be 120 uh, Fahrenheit. And it, it, it boiled, the baby boiled, the babies have died. So yeah. now what people do, they have harnesses, smartphone harnesses. You put the smartphone harness on the baby and put the smartphone on the baby. And then mom, she won't forget the baby because her smartphone's on the baby. Where's my phone? Where's my phone? Okay. Oh, the baby's on the baby. Oh, she'll pick up the baby. She won't leave the baby in the car because she's not going to go anywhere without her phone. That's it. Sickness. Sickness. But you have to look in, and, and this is the evil inclination that's never been stronger in this generation. Ever since, since he tempted Adam and Eve, he's never been stronger because the evil inclination has people into inconsequential things. He gives them fun and games so they don't engage in their soul correction, they engage what they're supposed to be doing. So that means we have to. We have to close our eyes, and we close our eyes from the physical world, then all of a sudden, the tribulations, they're not difficult anymore. <laughs> okay. Uh, the soul has an ingrained trait where when the soul is having tribulations, it squints because it doesn't want to see this world. The soul knows that to, uh, to weather the tribulations, to turn the suffering into good, it has to look at Hashem. And this is soul does this. This is our manufacturer's equipment. It's in the, included in the, in, included in the, in the in the product. 
אוקיי, ואף שאדם אינו יודע כלום, מה הוא עושה, אף על פי אין כאן נפש לדעת. אם אדם לא יודע מה זה טוב, אז הוא יודע מה זה טוב. על כן מוטבל לסתום את עיניו בשעת ייסורים. therefore we have a natural trait to close our eyes at the times of tribulations. this ends part three. God willing next week we'll go on to part four. and meanwhile everybody should have a wonderful week.